All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video today, we're going to be talking about glial cells. We're going to talk about their structure, and we're going to talk about their function. Also, before you guys continue this video, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Subscribe. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, Ninja so we got to talk about glial cells. Now, glial cells, is a, it's important to know what they are. So you got to know that there's nervous tissue. When we talk about neural tissue or nervous tissue, it's made up of two cellular components neurons and glial cells okay that's the first thing so that's the first thing i want you to know the second thing i want you to know is that you can find glial cells in the central nervous system which is consisting of your brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system which is all the nerves right the somatic motor sensory autonomic nerves so you have glial cells that are basically associated with neurons in your nervous system now it's important to know what are those glial cells, what do they look like, and what do they do. But not just list them. We got to know how they do these things and why they do these things. That's the purpose of learning, right? So the first one we got to talk about is the big daddy. This one does so much that it's worth a pretty decent discussion on them. And this is your astrocytes. Now, astrocytes are these really amazing glial cells, and they are only found in the central nervous system. So that's really important. They're found in the central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord, okay? Now, they have multiple, multiple functions, okay? What are those functions? The first one is really important, and it's actually gonna be a part of your blood-brain barrier, all right? So, the blood-brain barrier, you should ask, what is the blood-brain barrier made up of? What does it do, and how do the astrocytes play a role in that? That's the questions you should have. So, what we're going to do here is you have a kind of like a, a transverse section of the brain, right? And we're looking in the skull at the brain tissue. And you see all these blood vessels that are kind of surrounding that brain tissue? What we're going to do is we're going to take a slice of this blood vessel supplying this nervous tissue and zoom in on it. But the question I have for you is what is nervous tissue made up of? Glial cells and neurons. So here's our blood vessel that we're zooming in on and here's the nervous tissue that we're zooming in on. The first thing that you guys, I asked you, what should we think about when we talk about blood brain barrier? What is it made up of? It's actually three layers. The first layer is this kind of like maroon colored layer which is basically a part of the blood vessel. And this first layer here is actually your endothelial cells. Very important, you need to know the order of things here. Endothelial cells, that's these cells here. The next thing that's also important that you have to know is you see these little blue structures between the endothelial cells? These are proteins called tight junctions. So there's lots of tight junctions that are present in this blood-brain barrier, lots of them. You need them, why? Because they basically control what type of things, if we had a molecule here, it's gonna be very difficult for it to pass between the cell. So it controls the permeability across that membrane. That's one big thing. The second component is this green tissue here just situated outside of that. See this green tissue here? That green tissue is called the basal lamina. It's called your basal lamina. And the basal lamina is just basically connective tissue. That's all it is. It's just a little bit of protein. The next part is the big part, and this is your astrocytes. But particularly, what part of the astrocyte? Well, here's the nucleus or the cell body of it, and all these like little squid arms coming out to it is called the foot processes. So this is called your foot processes of your astrocytes, okay? So that's the first question that we've answered. When we talk about blood-brain barrier, zooming in on this, three layers, endothelial cells with lots of tight junctions, basal lamina, foot processes of astrocytes. There is other cells that kind of squiggle around in here, not really that important, but they're called pericytes in case you do want to know that. You might see that sometimes in textbooks. All right, good. We know what the blood-brain barrier is actually made up of. Now the second question is, what does it do? It's pretty straightforward. It controls what molecules leave the blood and go into the nervous tissue. That's all it does. For example, think about this. Think about it pretty simple. 
What kind of things would be able to pass easily, just completely diffuse over into the nervous tissue? Things that are lipid soluble or like respiratory gases, right? So CO2, which is a byproduct of neurons, that could just diffuse right over, right? Because it, it could just move right over. Oxygen, same thing. It could diffuse from the blood and go straight to the neural tissues, right? What else could move across? You know, anything that's lipid soluble, so drugs, certain vitamins, things like that, that could easily pass right across this membrane because it's lipid. It can passively diffuse. Other things like water, things like sodium, things like chloride, right? These kinds of substances, it may be a lot more difficult for them to move across. They need specific types of proteins, if you will, little shuttles to take and kind of shuttle them across. So I might need little proteins present here to shuttle these molecules across into the neural tissues. So that's important, okay? The next thing is what I really want you to understand. Let's say here we have a protein, big old protein. This protein, we don't want it to be able to just diffuse across. Why do we not want this to diffuse across? If we have proteins that come over here into the vicinity where the neural tissue is, maybe it will undesirably stimulate or inhibit the neural tissues. That could lead to undesired neural activity. So we do not want these proteins to get across this actual blood-brain barrier because they could lead to unnecessary processes. Okay, that's important. So what have we established? We have established that the blood-brain barrier is made up of these components it's a barrier that it controls very selective movement to and from across this membrane. And one of the big reasons is we don't want things like proteins that could get into the neural tissue and cause undesired neural activities, okay? Third thing, what in the heck do the astrocytes contribute to this? You would probably quickly say, oh, they're just a part of the barrier. Yes, but that's actually mildly what they're involved in. What they're really actually doing is they secrete a pro they secrete like little uh, molecules, little molecules like growth factors. And what these growth factors do is, is they stimulate these endothelial cells. You know what these endothelial cells do as a result of that? They make more tight junctions. If I make more and more tight junctions, what happens to the permeability across this blood brain barrier? It becomes even more selective. So why is that important? If you damage these astrocytes, what happens to the uh, tight junction production? It decreases. If the tight junction production decreases, what happens to this actual blood-brain barrier now? It becomes more permeable. Things can easily diffuse across it, and that becomes disastrous. That's important and why I want you to know that. The next thing that we have to talk about is that there is areas in the body where the blood-brain barrier is actually broken. And that's important too. What are those areas and why are those areas important? Let's take a look over here. The next thing I want you to know is that where is the blood-brain barrier? So there's areas in the brain where the blood-brain barrier is broken, if you will. In other words, it doesn't completely exist there. And there's a reason why. What is the blood-brain barrier's job? To control the movement of molecules from the blood to the nervous tissues, right? That's pretty much what it does. <clears throat> what if you actually want things to be able to cross the blood and go into the nervous tissue easily? Why would that be important? Think about it. See this little area here, this blue area present within the medulla? Very interesting area. It's called the area <laughs> postrema. Area postrema. The area postrema is cool because blood that's coming to this area, the blood that's in coming and supplying like this area here, it's actually carrying maybe molecules that are a um, little bit nasty in our body. And maybe it's things like ketones, maybe it's certain drugs. And what the area postrema does is it samples that stuff from the blood. Maybe it's toxins. And it signals an area in our midbrain called the chemo trigger zone. And you know what the chemo trigger zone does? It triggers vomiting. So whenever there are certain toxins or drugs, or certain things in the body that we want to get rid of, that area postrema can sense that because the blood-brain barrier is broken there. And it can tell our body to vomit it out and get rid of that toxin. That's pretty cool and very interesting. 
The next area is up here, okay? This is kind of just around your hypothalamus. So just around the vicinity of the hypothalamus, there are these other special structures here called osmoreceptors. There are some pretty intense names of these sons of guns. I am definitely not gonna write them out because one, they are too long, and the other one is, I don't know if I can spell them, that they're called the subfernicular organ and the organum vasculosum of lamina terminalis. <laughs> Anyway, regardless of all that, they sample the blood. And why is that important? What if the blood is really salty? What if the blood is really sugary? What if the blood is really watered down? We need to take into consideration all of that. Why? Because they can sense that and then tell us to drink more water if we need more water, drink less water if we need less water, or signal our pituitary gland. You know the posterior pituitary makes ADH? signal ADH production so that we can go ahead and actually uh, maybe increase our water reabsorption and pee less. All of those things come into our water balance. So that's really cool. The last area is between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. We're just going to denote this as the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the HPA, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. What happens is between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, what is the hypothalamus doing? It's secreting little hormones, things like uh, CRH and GR, uh, GRHH and uh, uh, GNRH, all of these different releasing factors that have to circulate through the blood and get to the anterior pituitary. So we need a connection between that for hormones to flow to between the hypothalamus and the other areas of the uh, tissue of the brain, which is the anterior pituitary. Also, we need to be able to sample things around the area of the hypothalamus. So again, you're sampling different things from the body. So these are important areas that I need you to remember. The blood-brain barrier is broken in these three areas. There is other ones, but I think that these are the most important ones for you to remember, okay? All right, that covers the function of astrocytes with respect to the blood-brain barrier. Now let's talk about the second function, which is how it acts as a potassium buffer. You know with the neurons, right? Here we have a neuron. You know whenever a neuron's generating an action potential, right? They're sending positive charges down the axon because sodium's flushing into the cell. During repolarization, what happens? Voltage eta potassium channels open and potassium starts exiting the cell, right? So during the repolarization phase of the action potential, potassium is like really leave, leaving this axon and really accumulating out here in the extracellular space, right? Same thing, when the cell is at rest, right? When the cell is at rest, resting membrane potential, you have what's called potassium leaky channels. And potassium will be leaking out of these actual neurons at rest, right? And a lot of this potassium can sit out here into this extracellular space. Now, our neurons have a way to push some of that potassium back in. What is the way that they do that? Well, there's little proteins present here um, throughout the neuron called sodium potassium ATPases. And what they do is they pump two potassium into this neuron, and then they pump out three sodium ions. So some of the potassium that sits out here, we can try to pump it back in. But nonetheless, over time, there's still just gonna be a little bit potassium that's remaining out here that those sodium potassium ATPases won't be able to push enough back in. We don't want all the potassium sitting out here. Why? Think about this. Think about it really simply. If you have a cell, and we know with cells, potassium is really high in the cell and really low outside the cell. And that establishes this concentration gradient that moves potassium out of the cell. Well, if because you don't remove any of this excess potassium, what happens? The potassium concentration will start rising out here if you don't get rid of this excess potassium. Now, this concentration gradient where potassium wants to go from inside the cell to outside the cell is gonna be decreased because there's not as much of a gradient here now. So now less potassium will leave this neuron. And why is that a problem? Well, if le less potassium, let's just say for a second, less potassium left this neuron. Why would that become a problem? Well then, if less potassium left, potassium is positively charged. You'd have more positive charge inside of this neuron. And initially, initially, that would increase the excitability.
Now we're not going to get into this. I might contradict myself. And the reason why is it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Initially, because of all these positive charges, it increases the excitability of the neuron. But eventually, it'll actually decrease excitability. And this is due to the voltage-gated sodium channels. Whenever it's positive for too long, they become inactivated. But regardless, that's important. So how do we prevent this increased excitability initially and then eventually a decreased excitability? Well, guess what? These astrocytes are here to the rescue. They have little channels on them. And what they do is they take this potassium up and they can store some of this potassium inside of them. You know what else is really cool? If maybe too much potassium is getting stored inside of this astrocyte, guess what it can do? It has little gap junctions and it can actually connect with another astrocyte and push some of these potassium ions into another astrocyte to make sure that not too much potassium is sitting in this one astrocyte. Now, if the potassium levels are maybe depleted a little bit, guess what the astrocyte can do? It can push some of that potassium out if it needs to. But the main job is that it's mopping up this excess potassium so that we don't affect the action potentials of these neurons. Initially, you'll have increased excitability, but because those voltage-gated sodium channels become locked in inactivation from prolonged positive charges, their excitability decreases. That's why we need them. All right, let's move on to the next function. You got, let's say here we have a neuron and here we have a neuron. Let's say there are two different types of neurons. Let's just label this neuron here as a glutaminergic neuron. What the heck does that mean? That means that it produces and makes glutamate. Now, this other neuron here, let's call this one a gabergic neuron, okay? Gabergic neuron. That means that it produces GABA. All right, cool. This neuron, let's say that it's gonna be releasing some glutamate, right? Let's say that it, there's an action potential, right? So you have an action potential, positive charges from the sodium ions are rushing down, triggers calcium, influx into this neuron, causes the cell membrane of these vesicles to fuse with the actual cell membrane here. And then once it fuses, it starts to release out what? The neurotransmitters. What is this neurotransmitter here again? This is called glutamate. Now, that glutamate can then do what? It can then move across the synaptic cleft here and then bind on to little uh, ligand-gated ion channels, right? There's little pockets for it to bind on to and trigger ion influx, right? Positive ions generally. Well, after it works on this neuron here, what happens? Well, we don't want it to stay there because it's just gonna keep stimulating this neuron. So how do we prevent that? Well, eventually, what happens is this glutamate, after it binds with this receptor, it'll disassociate, and then there's little transport protein here. Let's call this a glutamate uh, reuptake protein. That's what we're gonna, we're gonna denote as that, glutamate reuptake protein. And what happens is this is going to take this glutamate back in to this glutaminergic neuron, and we're just gonna recycle it. We're gonna put him back into these vesicles and just keep reusing him. Problem is though, these glutamate receptor reuptake proteins can get saturated after a while and they can't take up as much glutamate. And so guess what will happen? Glutamate will just start accumulating and sit, sitting in this synapse. We can't let that happen. It's gonna keep stimulating this neuron. So how do we prevent that? These good old astrocytes, they got little proteins here. They got little special transporters that can take this glutamate up any of the excess glutamate that's sitting in this synapse, it can take up into its cell. Then what it does is, it takes the glutamate and does something really cool that these other cells can't do. It converts that glutamate into what's called glutamine. There's an enzyme called glutamine synthetase and it catalyzes this step here and makes glutamine. Now here's what's cool, okay? That glutamine, can then be transported out of this astrocyte. And then guess what? There's a glutamine transporter present on this neuron. We're gonna take that glutamine, transport it back in. Let's actually write here, glutamine. It's gonna take that glutamine that it synthesized and put it back into this neuron. Guess what? Inside that glutamine, inside of this actual neuron here, guess what it can do? It can get converted via an enzyme Okay, there's an enzyme here called glutaminase, and it'll take and convert glutamine back into glutamate. 
And guess what we can do with that glutamate? We can incorporate it back into these vesicles and reuse it whenever this protein is just too saturated with too much excess glutamate. So that's what our astrocytes can do. Now, what else can they do? We gotta remember, GABA is actually a precursor, it's actually developed from glut uh, glutamate as well. So on the other situation where the same thing could happen, let's say that also from this you're releasing lots of GABA, right? and that GABA is sitting into the synapses and you need to make more of it, right? Same thing here, guess what? We can take this glutamine, push it into this GABAergic neuron. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that glutamine, guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna use an enzyme called glutaminase. Convert that into glutamate. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that glutamate and use another enzyme called glutamate uh, decarboxylase, and we're going to take off a structure here and turn this into GABA. And then from here, we can put that into these vesicles where we need more GABA. So astrocytes are important in removing any of the excess neurotransmitters and helping in the synthesis of what two neurotransmitters? GABA and glutamate. Okay? That's important. All right. The next function of these actual astrocytes is they control glycogen and glucose metabolism. The next thing that's really important here is that uh, glucose is a very important fuel for neurons, right? So if we look here, here's our neuron, right? This is our neuron, and then this is our astrocyte. Now what happens is glucose is really important inside of these neurons. You know why? Because glucose can be broken down into pyruvate, you guys know all this. And then eventually it can go into acetyl-CoA, go through the Krebs cycle, all that jazz, and then eventually make ATP. We know this process. But let's say, right, that the neurons, maybe they're not getting enough glucose. Maybe there's not enough oxygen. I, whatever the reason is, there's a decline in ATP production, okay? Astrocytes will be able to sense this decrease in ATP. And guess what, they, they, they help out. They're little, uh, they're little awesome little guys here. And so what happens is there's a special protein here. Remember how we said that the blood-brain barrier, the astrocytes are a part of that? Well, there's a protein, remember how we said how water and, 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 uh, and so, uh, sodium and chloride and all those things have to be, their select permeability. We need proteins to transport them. Same thing, I'm gonna represent glucose as this G. In order for me to move glucose from the blood into the nervous tissues, I need a transporter to move them across. And that's actually called a GLUT transporter. And if you really want to know which type, it's called GLUT1. Now, once we take this glucose inside, guess what we can do with it? Well, we can first off maybe store it as glycogen because you know that that's called glycogenesis, right? Or we could take that glucose, convert it into pyruvate, and then eventually take this down to acetyl-CoA, go to the Krebs cycle, and make some ATP for itself, right? Here's what's really cool, though. In situations like this, where there's decreased ATP inside of the neurons, these astrocytes take and convert their pyruvate into lactate, right? So let's say here, right? There's some situation where there's a decreased ATP in the neuron, right? Glucose can convert into glycogen whenever it's taking up in the astrocytes. Astrocytes can take up glucose converted into glycogen. If there's decreased ATP, what can happen is the astrocytes can break down the glycogen into glucose called glycogenolysis. Then glucose will get broken down into pyruvate. Astrocytes also have the ability to convert pyruvate into lactate. Then what they can do is they have special transporters that push the lactate out of this actual cell, the astrocytes, and guess what they do? They have transporters on the neuron that pump lactate in. And then guess what we can do with that lactate? We can convert that lactate into pyruvate. Pyruvate can then go down, make acetyl-CoA, go through the Krebs cycle, and do what? Make lots of ATP. So let's review this real quick, because I know it's a lot of stuff. Neurons have decreased ATP. Astrocytes sense that. Astrocytes have the ability to make glycogen. Whenever there's low ATP, they can break their glycogen down into glucose. Glucose can then get converted into pyruvate, pyruvate to lactate. There's transporters on the astrocytes. They pump the lactate out. Lactate gets taken up by the neurons. Lactate can get converted back into pyruvate, and then pyruvate can go down and make ATP for the neuron.
So that's, that's, that's the cool part. They can act as a glycogen reserve whenever neurons need the fuel. Oh, that's cool. All right. The other important thing just to add on, there is glucose transporters, because I only talked about how glucose is getting into these astrocytes. It is important to realize that there is glut transporters present on these neurons. So just in the same way, this glucose can also pass this blood-brain barrier and also get into neurons. How? There's special transporter here called a GLUT3. So when we talk about GLUT transporters on the blood-brain barrier, it's one. If it's on the neurons, it's three. All right, cool. The last thing that I wanna say before we move on to the satellite cells, which is kind of like the PNS counterpart of the astrocytes, is astrocytes have another function here. The exact mechanism, there, I couldn't find in any textbooks and I don't think they truly know, but they also have seen that astrocytes can increase the synapses within neurons. So increasing interaction between neurons can play a role in a lot of different aspects. That means a bunch of different things. So again, another additional thing to add on, uh, but without an underlying mechanism, is that astrocytes also can increase the function of synapses between neurons. All right, the last thing I wanna mention here to finish up here is that we also have satellite cells. Now the important thing to remember is satellite cells are like the astrocytes, if you will, of the peripheral nervous system. That's basically the easiest way to remember them. Instead of having to go through all the mechanisms for uh, that, the uh, satellite cells, just remember that they perform most of these functions with the exception of like the blood-brain barrier. They pretty much do all the functions of the astrocytes just in the peripheral nervous system. So again, they control nutrient metabolism. They control glucose, uh, I'm sorry, neurotransmitter regulation. They control nutrient control, potassium mopping, all of that stuff. The only thing that I wanna add on to that is that we only really find them in two places is what I really want you to know. One is if you look here, we have our spinal cord, right? Spinal cord's a part of the central nervous system. They're only found in the PNS. So you have to talk about nerves here. You know when you talk about a nerve, there's this nerve in actually the dorsal root. It's called your dorsal root ganglion, right? And a dorsal root ganglion is just a group of cell bodies outside of the dorsal, in the dorsal root, right? And what happens is these satellite cells, they love to surround the cell body of this dorsal root ganglion. And so they, again, are controlling the, the nutrient, the neurotransmitters, the potassium, all the things that are diffusing across, and it's modulating that for these dorsal root ganglions. The other thing is, it also is surrounding the cell bodies of your autonomic ganglia. Your autonomic ganglia, that's for what structures? Your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. So it's also surrounding the cell bodies of your autonomic ganglia. If you guys can think about this, what is the name of the ganglia for the sympathetic that's in front of the uh, vertebra or in front of the actual uh, kind of spinal cord? We call that prevertebral. What are the ones on the side? Paravertebral. Those satellite cells are surrounding those ganglia. What about the ganglia for the parasympathetic nervous system? Those are close to the target organ. Those are called terminal ganglia. So you see how we're kind of mixing in a bunch of different things. So satellite cells, astrocytes of the PNS, everything we talked about, situated where? Dorsal root ganglia and autonomic ganglia. Boom, roasted, let's move on. All right, Nishner, so now let's talk about the oligodendrocytes versus the Schwann cells. Pretty straightforward stuff what they do, just they do it a little bit differently in different areas of the body, okay? So the oligodendrocytes, they pretty much, what they do is they put around myelin sheaths, which is these lipid fatty sheaths. And we'll talk about what that does a little bit later, but what I want you to know is these oligodendrocytes, they put these lipid protein sheaths on the axons of neurons in the central nervous system. So when we talk about oligodendrocytes, what do they do? They myelinate axons in the central nervous system. Now we gotta add in one more thing because this is where it's really cool. Technically, cranial nerve two, the optic nerve, is a nerve that is technically considered to be a part of the central nervous system. So oligodendrocytes myelinate axons in the central nervous system and cranial nerve two, the optic nerve. Now the Schwann cells on the other hand, what they do is they myelinate 
axons in the peripheral nervous system, right? Now, when we talk about that, what are we actually saying? We're talking about the spinal nerves, right? So all your spinal nerves, as well as cranial nerve three, all the way till 12. So that's important to remember. So we're myelinating axons in the peripheral nervous system for the Schwann cells, myelinating axons in the central nervous system and cranial nerve two for the oligodendrocytes. Next thing that's also important to remember, oligodendrocytes, if you look at them, one oligodendrocyte myelinates how many axons? Multiple axons. That's gonna come into play a little bit later. So the next thing I want you to know is that oligodendrocytes myelinate multiple axons. How many? One oligodendrocyte can myelinate up to 30 to 60 axons. Holy crap. Whereas Schwann cells, one Schwann cell can myelinate segments of one neuron or one axon. So Schwann cells myelinate one axon and sometimes multiple Schwann cells for one axon. That's very, very important. Okay, the next thing that I want you to understand here is that whenever there is damage to the oligodendrocytes and it causes this demyelination of the axons in the central nervous system, that cannot be regenerated. So whenever there is damage to the oligodendrocytes, they cannot, whenever there's damage, okay, let's say, let's put it like this, oligodendrocyte damage, there's no ability for regeneration, okay? Whereas when you talk about Schwann cells, if there's damage to the, swans, uh, the Schwann cells, if they're damaged, they do have the ability to regenerate. That is very important. So the next thing that's important of why we should know this is that when, you know whenever you demyelinate, basically you remove the myelin sheaths around the axons in the central nervous system, you know what that's called? So demyelination of the axons in the central nervous system can lead to a disease called multiple sclerosis. That's important to remember. Whereas if you demyelinate the axons in the peripheral nervous system, What's that called? That's usually referred to as Guillain-Barre syndrome. That's important to remember. All right, beautiful. So now we know what oligodendrocytes do. We know what the Schwann cells do. We know how they, for the most part, do it differently. The next thing that I want you to know is something a little bit special about the structure of the Schwann cells myelinating these axons. So I want you to take, for example, we're going to be looking at this, we're going to take a section right here, and we're going to look on end at the nerve and the Schwann cell surrounding it. Here we're going to have the cell body, right? And what happens is the cell body gives off kind of like these little like extensions, if you will, that tries to come around and like swaddle this nerve. So it's trying to just kind of swaddle that nerve. In this state, if we just looked at it like this, this is technically not myelinated because it's not completely covering the axon. So this, in this state, it's actually not myelinated, unmyelinated, if you will, okay? So unmyelinated. All right, but then guess what happens, what these Schwann cells do? They're really cool. What they do is, is they take these little swaddling arms and when they come together, they start kind of wrapping around and wrapping around and twisting around the axon to where they make multiple kind of like concentric layers of their like little swaddling arms around that nerve. This, in this state, it's myelinated. So that's really cool, but here's what we gotta actually expand on a little bit more. If you really look at it, there's a special name. And I wanna make sure that we kind of like outline this. The way the Schwann cells do that, they have, let's say that we kind of do it like this here. This part here, I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna like show this kind of like like lines here, okay? And then everything else, we're just gonna do these solid lines. All of these solid lines inside of these kind of like dotted lines here, these kind of like lines here, this right here, from this here to this here, this is called your myelin sheath. But then this layer right here, 
outside of the myelin sheath, which is formed by the actual swan cell, swan cell, this is referred to as the neurolemma, which is basically the cell membrane of the actual Schwann cell. The neurolemma is why Schwann cells have the ability to regenerate. Whenever you damage this actual like entire structure from a condition like Guillain-Barre syndrome, they, these actual Schwann cells, that neurolemma allows for them to be able to regenerate, reform, and help to remyelinate axons after they've been damaged. That's very important. All right, cool. We've established that understanding. Now, we talked about what these glial cells do, right, how they form myelin. We need to know what the heck myelin is and why it's important to know that. All right, so what is myelin, what is it, and what does it do? I guess that's the important thing for us to ask, right? So we know the oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells make myelin. What does it do? What is it made up of? Myelin is basically a combination of a bunch of lipids and some proteins. That's really what it is. And all it's designed to do is act as a good insulator and increase action potentials down the axons of a neuron. That's all it really does. So if you were to take into comparison, looking at this neuron, which is myelinated, and this neuron, which is not myelinated, which one will have increasing action potentials? Obviously, it's going to be the one that's myelinated, and this one will have slower action potentials. There's a specific name of the type of action potentials uh, upon which these neurons send their information down. And this one here with the myelinated axons is called saltatory conduction. And we'll talk about what the heck that means in a second, whereas those who are not myelinated, this is called continuous conduction. Okay, so it's called continuous conduction. All right, beautiful. So we understand the basics of myelin. Now, let's get into a little bit more detail about how it increases the action potentials and what the heck is the saltatory conduction. All right, so if we really zoom in here, Okay, on this portion, let's say, of the actual neuron, really zooming in on the axon, this is the view we're looking at right here. These are our, basically our Schwann cells, if you will, with the myelin sheaths around them, around the axon. Now, in between, there's little concentrated areas located in between each myelin sheath, right? So here we have like a little space here, and here we'll have a little space here where there would be another uh, Schwann cell with myelin sheath here. These little spaces here are called the nodes of Ranvier. So what is this little space here called? If we were to kind of highlight it, this space here is actually called the nodes of Ranvier. And what's important about these nodes of Ranvier is that each of these nodes of Ranvier are highly concentrated with voltage gated ion channels. What kind? Sodium and potassium. So let's say that at this point here, this, this area of the axon has been stimulated. It's reached its threshold uh, potential or voltage, and these voltage-gated sodium channels are activated. If they're activated, what happens is they open and allow for sodium ions to do what? To flow into this actual axon. Then what happens is this sodium ions will do what? So whenever all these sodium ions rush into the axon, right, generally what they would do is these positive charges would go by to the next voltage-gated sodium channel, stimulate it, and have more sodium ions to flow in, and it would just be a propagation, right? But what happens is those voltage-gated sodium channels are absent. They're not in the vicinity of where the myelin sheath is. So because of that, these ions can't actually like go and stimulate other channels for more ions to flow in. Instead, they have to move down the axon to the next area, the next node of Ranvier, if you will, where there's more concentrated voltage-gated sodium channels, stimulate them, they open, sodium will flow in at this area, at this node, and all these positive ions, again, there's no voltage-gated sodium channels where the myelin sheaths are, so they'll have to move down really fast until they encounter the next voltage-gated sodium channel, activate it, and then the ions will come in. So this type of way, if you were looking at it like this, you would see depolarization at this node, and then you would have this period of where you wouldn't see kind of any action potential where the myelin sheath is, then another depolarization wouldn't see it because of the myelin sheath, and then another depolarization. So it looks like the action potential is like skipping from each node of Ranvier to the next, and that is what we call saltatory conduction. Now. The question that 
I would always want to know is how does these myelin sheaths basically help these ions to move faster? There's two reasons. We're going to write them down in a second. I just want you to trust me for right now. One is that there is no permeability at this point where the myelin sheath is. There's no voltage gated sodium channels or potassium channels here. So because of that, no ions can actually come in at these points. So now the ions have to move along the axon. The second reason is a little bit more physics incorporated to really kind of dumb it down. This also has the ability to act as, uh, has what's called a decreased membrane capacitance. So myelin sheaths decrease membrane capacitance. What does that mean? It means that there's less negative charge on the cell membrane. Now, why is that important? Let's imagine here that there was a lot of negative charges. If positive ions had to flow this way, down the axon to get to the next area of voltage gated sodium channels. And they had this little like negative charges over here. What may that want, like what they kind of want to do? They may want to come over here and interact with these negative charges. And that might slow down the flow of positive charges down the axons. Guess what myelin sheaths do? They allow for less negative charge because they have decreased membrane capacitance, right? And if there's less negative charge there, what happens? Now less of these positive ions are gonna to wanna to interact with the negative charges and most of them are gonna to want to now do what? Only move down the axon, okay? So that's the reasons why is it's due to membrane capacitance and membrane resistance. Basically, they have decreased permeability at the level of the myelin sheaths and less negative charges. That's the whole point. The same concept exists here for the voltage gated potassium channels. We're not gonna power through in the same detail, but the same concept exists. You hit a voltage here, what happens? Potassium moves out. If the potassium moves out, negative charges. Is there any permeability at this point where the myelin sheath is? No. Is there any positive charges or negative charges at this point? No. So there's not much membrane capacitance and no permeability. Where can it only go? Down the axon. Gets to the next point, stimulates these voltage gated potassium channels. What happens? Potassium ions leave. If the potassium ions leave the cell, what happens? Inside of the cell becomes negative. Again, where the myelin sheaths are, are there any voltage gated channels? No. Is there a lot of charge here? No. So where is it gonna move? Only down the axon. So that's why conduction potentials move faster down the axon when myelin is there. All right, now what I wanna do is recap this in particular terminology and then talk about a couple extra things. All right, so we talked about how myelin basically increases conduction velocity, right? But there's another aspect that I wanna talk about. When we talk about conduction velocity or the speed um, of action potentials down the axon, there's two things that basically increase the conduction velocity. One, we've already discussed, myelination. The more myelinated the neurons are, the faster the conduction velocity. The second thing is diameter. Think about this, it's, pretty, it's relatively straightforward when you think about diameter. If you have some type of axon, right, that has a small diameter, that means more resistance, right? And if you have more resistance to flow, what does that mean for the actual flow of charge? That means that there's gonna be a decrease in flow, in this case, charge. So if we have a large diameter, that'll decrease the resistance of charge flowing, and that'll actually increase the flow of charge down the axon. So conduction velocity is dependent upon these two things. That leads to the next concept, which comes up. There's different types of neurons that have different degrees of myelination. You can remember them in the most simplest way, right? If you talk about the myelinated uh, fibers, myelinated neurons, if you will. There is type A, and if you really wanted to get into the nitty gritty, there's A alpha, A beta, A gamma, and A delta. All I really want you to know out of all of these is that these have the fastest conduction velocity. So they are the most myelinated of the axons. The second one is the B fibers, okay? The B fibers, these ones are going to have a moderate conduction velocity, okay? And these ones are moderately myelinated. And the final ones is your C fibers. And your C fibers, these are going to have pretty much no myelin or very little myelin, so they're going to have very low conduction velocities.
So that is important. And obviously there's various different types. I don't wanna cover that in this video. Maybe in future lectures we can cover all these different types of nerve fibers. But again, basic concept is that as you go down from A to C, myelin decreases and so does the actual conduction velocity. So that's an important thing to take away. All right, so now let's go ahead and finish up with the ependymal cells and microglia. All right, Nizhder, so let's move on to the ependymal cells. Ependymal cells are these specialized, like uh, kind of like cuboidal cells located within the ventricles of our central nervous system. So if we're taking a look here, imagine here, again, we got that transverse section of the brain. We're looking into that skull. This is what you're gonna kind of see, right? We see all these like blue structures here, right? You see like this is your lateral ventricle, lateral ventricle, and then here in between the thalami is your third ventricle. What we're gonna do here is, is we're just gonna take a little cut. And here you have some blood vessels that are kind of supplying a little bit around that area. What we're gonna do is, is we're gonna take a cut right here and zoom in on it and take a look. Now, first thing I need you to know what we're actually looking at here and what the ependymal cells are a part of is they're a part of, we're gonna actually label this, this is a part of what's called your blood CSF barrier. That is what they're a part of, your blood CSF barrier. That begs the question then, what the heck is the blood CSF barrier made up of? What does it do? And how do the ependymal cells contribute to that? That's what you should know. All right, the blood CSF barrier, what is it made up of? It's made up of a couple layers. First layer here, kind of similar to the blood brain barrier, but different. First layer, these kind of like maroon cells. These are endothelial cells. Here's the difference though. Do you see tight junctions between them? No, you do not. So because of that, these are different than the blood-brain barrier. In the blood-brain barrier, the endothelial cells are really tightly connected. The endothelial cells in, uh, in the actual blood CSF barrier are actually fenestrated. They're actually fenestrated, so they're a little bit more permeable, okay? The second thing that you need to know is the green layer there. That green layer there, in, uh, right after the append, uh, endothelial cells, is called what? That is called your basal lamina. And again, your basal lamina is just basically connective tissue. That's all it is. And then the last layer here is going to be these black cells here. And these black cells are going to be your cuboidal cells, but specifically which one? The ependymal cells. Now here's where you gotta add on this additional thing. If you look at the ependymal cells, this one, this one, this one, this one, what's kind of situated between them? Lots of tight junctions. So, we have lots of tight junctions located between the ependymal cells, whereas in the actual blood-brain barrier, what did we have the, a lot of the tight junctions between? The endothelial cells. So, important to remember, this is the layer of the blood CSF barrier, and the tight junctions are in between the ependymal cells. So now, the most selective, the most selectively permeable portion of the blood CSF barrier is which area now? the ependymal cells. Now, we know what it's made up of. Now, what does it do? Same thing as the blood-brain barrier. If I wanna move water across over here, this is gonna control it. If I wanna move oxygen across, if I wanna pick up CO2, this controls it. If I wanna move glucose, right, we'll represent it like this. If I wanna move sodium, if I want to move chloride, any of these molecules, I obviously need special transport proteins to move all of these molecules across, okay? That is really important. Now, when all of these molecules like sodium, chloride, glucose, water, all of that stuff is pushed over through all of these cell layers and goes into this little space, what is this space here called? This here is called a ventricle. So we're gonna call this portion here a ventricle. Which ventricle could it be? Well, it depends on which area of the brain we're in. Could be the lateral ventricle, could be the third ventricle, could be the fourth ventricle. We're just zooming in on that area. And so now if all of this stuff comes over here, water, maybe a little bit of oxygen, maybe there's some glucose, maybe there's some sodium, some chloride, stuff like that. Maybe there's even small amino acids present over here. All of that stuff sitting in this ventricle is now made what type of fluid? Cerebral spinal fluid. 
So this is now what we refer to as CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. So the ependymal cells are part of the blood CSF barrier. This is the component. What do they do? They control the movement of ions across this barrier. And what do they make? Cerebrospinal fluid. Guess what else they do? You see how they have like these little uh, kind of like cilia, if you will. You know, cilia is important because it kind of like uh, has motion. It can move and beat things. And so any of the cerebral spinal fluid that's actually made here, guess what these ependymal cells do? They beat and move the cerebral spinal fluid. So when someone says, Zach, what does the ependymal cells do? You say it's a part of the blood CSF barrier, helps to secrete, cere make cerebral spinal fluid, as well as circulate the cerebral spinal fluid. Boom, roasted. Let's move on to microglia. All right, so the last uh, glial cell that I wanna cover is microglia. Now these are really cool, but it's very interesting how they actually come to be. So, you know within your bone marrow, right? You have your actual, uh, your, your red bone marrow, which is kind of present within flat bones, red bone marrow. Well, in the red bone marrow, let's just say it's right here within this bone, they make white blood cells, a particular type of white blood cell. And this type of white blood cell is called a monocyte. Now this monocyte, when it's made by the bone marrow, guess where it migrates to? Your central nervous system. In the central nervous system, it actually kind of differentiates into a special type of white blood cell. And this is called a microglia cell. Now microglia, their function is basically they act as an immune system cell in the nervous system. That's basically what they are. So what happens is, let's say that there's a pathogen. For some situation, there's a pathogen. And this pathogen, right, is causing damage to this neuron. So this neuron is now damaged. What happens is, from this neuron damage, there may be cellular debris that's released out here. There may be cytokines that are released out to this area. What that does is those cytokines are gonna do what? they're going to stimulate this microglia and it's gonna become activated. When this microglia becomes activated and is informed that there's some type of injury of the surrounding nerve tissue, maybe due to a pathogen, this sucker goes ham and starts releasing nitric oxide. It starts releasing uh, free radicals, okay? It starts also releasing different types of uh, really destructive molecules okay, as well as cytokines, maybe other different types of cytokines to activate other microglia cells. So to release nitric oxide and different types of reactive oxygen species, free radicals and cytokines. This nitric oxide, reactive oxygen species, free radicals, what it's gonna try to do, what it wants to do is destroy the pathogen that's causing this nerve damage. However, these things aren't like little, kind of like they can detect exactly where the injury is, sometimes there's a byproduct of that which it can also damage the neural tissue. And that can sometimes become a problem if there's lots of uh, inflammation in the area. You wanna know why? You know if uh, there's lots of this actual reactive oxygen species and stuff like that released, what does uh, surrounds the axon of a neuron that actually increases their conduction velocity? Do you guys know? We just talked about it, right? What is it? myelin. Guess what can happen whenever you have lots of inflammation and lots of microglia cells releasing lots of these damaging molecules? Guess what it can do? It can actually damage the myelin and cause demyelination of axons. That's important to remember. Now the other thing that these microglia cells can do is that let's say there is a pathogen in the area. Not only can it try to destroy that pathogen via releasing these destructive molecules, it can also go and phagocytose that. So then the other thing that can happen here is that it can undergo a phagocytosis process. And if it phagocytoses that actual pathogen, then look at this. Here's gonna be our microglia. It's phagocytosed that pathogen over there. Took it in. After it's destroyed it, then guess what it can do? It can make a protein that can express the piece of that actual uh, destructive pathogen on its cell membrane. And when it presents that on its cell membrane, it presents it on what's called an MHC2 molecule. And after it presents a piece of that pathogen on this MHC2 molecules, guess what can happen? 
T cells can cross your blood brain barrier. And when these T cells cross the blood brain barrier, they can come to this area. And when they come to this area, guess what happens? They interact with this. And when they interact here and they become activated, they start to release lots of cytokines. And these cytokines may activate the microglia more to release more dangerous molecules or cause more inflammatory reaction to happen in this area. The whole goal though is to break down and get rid of any cellular debris, any pathogen that's causing this damage. And the microglia cells can do that by these molecules, amplifying the immune response or phagocytosing them and presenting them to T cells. Okay, that is the microglia. Why am I stressing on all this? You know, whenever somebody has HIV, HIV for some reason loves to attack these cells. And that can lead to a lot of problems where these cells can become hyperactive, release a lot of these molecules, destructive molecules that can demyelinate axons and lead to a lot of encephalitis. So it's important to remember that. Okay, so that covers microglia. All right, engineers, so in this video today, we talk about glial cells. We talk about their structure and function. I hope it made sense. I hope you guys liked it. All right, engineers, as always, until next time. Thank you.